Good day everyone, this is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. We're continuing along the lines of fluid and electrolyte uh, pathophysiology. We just finished talking about sodium. I would like to say that sodium is considered the major extracellular cation. That is to say that it's a major positively charged ion or electrolyte that lives outside of the cells. The cells would rather have sodium outside. Potassium, which is what we're going to talk about now, however, is the major intracellular cation. Potassium generally likes to live inside of the cells. We do know that those two will exchange when we have depolarization, cardiac conduction, uh, nerve conduction, and, and, and things of that nature, that the sodium will go into the cell, potassium will go out, um, but that the cell will then actively transport um, sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell um, to reset itself for the next depolarization. Okay, so potassium, major, the major intracellular cation, so it's positively charged, uh, positively charged metal. The normal level of potassium is 3.5 to 4.5. Some people will say 3.5 to 5, depending on the resource. Milli equivalents per liter. Low levels of potassium, less than 3.5, are considered hypokalemia. That is the technical definition for low potassium. And elevated levels of potassium, greater than 4.5 or 5.0 milliequivalents per liter, um, is known as hyperkalemia, elevated potassium. The concern, that we, what we need to be concerned about with alterations in potassium, high or low, is going to be generally cardiac. So sodium is generally going to be a brain thing. When my sodium levels become altered, I'm going to have issues with my brain, or my nervous system. When potassium becomes altered, I'm going to have issues with my heart, my cardiac system, my cardiac conduction, um, especially with hyperkalemia, elevated levels of potassium. So I'll focus on that a little bit. What causes an elevated potassium level? Lots of things. Some patients that have what's known as congestive heart failure, uh, where they may um, retain a little more fluid um, than they should and kind of overloads the heart a little bit. The heart may already be weakened already. These patients are often given what are called diuretics. These are medications that promote the, the removal of fluid from the body through the kidneys. Uh, one of the common diuretics is a, what's known as a loop diuretic. It works on the loop of Henle in the kidney, um, and it's known as Lasix or furosemide. Now, um, this Lasix or furosemide, um, along with water, promoting the removal of water, it also promotes the um, removal of potassium. So often these patients will have low potassium levels, so we'll give them potassium supplements. Well, if these kidneys were, for some reason, not to work as well, or a patient were to inadvertently or intentionally overdose on their potassium um, supplements, they could develop hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is also common in patients with renal failure. Their kidneys do not work. And um, it can be acute or chronic renal failure. Uh, they can't eliminate potassium because the kidneys aren't working. Potassium builds up and they become hyperkalemic. And then they have all kinds of heart problems, uh, conduction problems, and irritability of the heart, and so on and so forth. Uh, other patients that are at risk for hyperkalemia include patients with massive burns because they have cell damage. And where does most of the potassium live? inside of the cell. Damage lots of cells, I can cause that potassium to leak out in, in, into the intravascular space. Uh, crush injuries, somebody gets crushed or they're, they're exposed to lots of trauma or they have lots of muscle breakdown. Um, there's something called rhabdomyolysis, which is massive muscle breakdown. Um, very common out here in New Mexico in uh, illegals uh, and immigrants that are found out in the desert, they become dehydrated. Um, their muscles start breaking down, they start you know, dying from this, and they release lots of potassium, and their potassium levels become elevated. Um, uh, and certain medications uh, can cause hyperkalemia as well. Um, hyperkalemia is generally going to be the thing that we're going to be worried about in respiratory. Uh, we need to be very concerned about it. If it's somebody in renal failure, maybe they need dialysis. Uh, be that as the case, um, it is something we want to be careful about, and it's something that you are going to talk about more in the as we go along in the program, more specific uh, conditions. But uh, this pathophysiology course is just kind of laying the foundation for for kind of what's to come. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, excuse me to calcium. 
Most of the calcium in the body lives inside of the bones, within the bones. Um, the normal level of calcium is 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Um, that's the common measure that you will see, the total, what's known as a total calcium. Um, they're also what we call ionized and non-ionized. Uh, generally what we'll be looking at are the total calcium. Um, low calcium is known as hypocalcemia. High calcium is known as hypercalcemia. Um, hypercalcemia, high calcium, isn't something we see very commonly. It can be associated with certain um, types of bone cancers, where they get cancer in the bone, um, and uh, that causes lots of calcium to be released. Um, that would be an instance. Um, hypocalcemia can be associated with lots of different things. Malnutrition, starvation, alcoholism, um, somebody in septic shock. They have an overwhelming infection. Um, they have lot. They're being given lots of diuretics, and they um, are diuresing lots of calcium. They're they're peeing out lots of calcium, and um, something uh, called hypoparathyroidism. And the parathyroid glands live or located alongside the thyroid gland, and, and often or sometimes what can happen is if I have surgery on my thyroid gland, those parathyroid glands can inadvertently become removed. Well, the parathyroid uh, glands secrete parathormone, uh, which is a, a hormone, um, and calcitonin actually they secrete uh, calcitonin as well, but um, the, the parathyroid glands secrete um, hormones that help regulate levels, uh, normal levels of calcium in the body. If they were to inadvertently become removed in somebody who's had thyroid surgery, um, that patient can develop a life-threatening hypocalcemia. And generally with calcium problems, what we'll see are neuromuscular issues. Um, hypocalcemia, they'll develop tetany, they can have seizures, tetany is kind of a locking up the muscles, uh, their reflexes become very irritable, and it can cause um, uh, problems that way. Uh, so that's calcium. The last electrolyte that we want to be really uh, cognizant of is magnesium. Uh, magnesium is ne another important electrolyte when it comes to cardiac conduction and, and proper contraction of the heart. Um, the normal level of magnesium is uh, 1.5 to 2 milliequivalents per liter. Elevated levels of magnesium are called hypermagnesemia. Low levels of magnesium are called hypomagnesemia. Um, where magnesium can become important for us in respiratory is in labor and delivery, where I have a, 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 a woman who's pregnant, and maybe she's developed some problems with her pregnancy. Maybe her blood pressure is really high. Maybe she's had a seizure, uh, and it's a life-threatening condition known as uh, eclampsia, where they develop seizures, uh, hypertension, um, premature labor. They go into labor early. Um, a whole plethora of issues can develop. And one of the medications that we, we often will see these, these um, people on is magnesium. They'll be on a magnesium infusion. And magnesium does um, uh, kind of depress some things and kind of help uh, prevent seizures, control seizures, help with blood pressure. Um, even uh, pa uh, some, some patients that go into premature labor, they go into labor too soon, sometimes you'll see them on magnesium infusions as well. Well, if they're on a magnesium infusion, um, it is possible that they can get too much magnesium and develop hypermagnesemia. And too high amounts of magnesium will actually depress the respiratory reflexes. It'll depress the respiratory drive. Um, so you may potentially find yourself as a therapist or even in clinicals being called to labor and delivery not to take care of a bad baby, but to take care of a mom who's not breathing very well. Maybe she's, she's lethargic, um, she's not acting right, she's tired, she's breathing very shallow, and, and her respiratory drive has been re um, depressed. Um, one of the things you need to assess when you're assessing this patient is, are they on a magnesium infusion and maybe have they received uh, too much magnesium and do we, we need to consider um, treating that, slowing it down, stopping it, what have you. Okay guys, so that's a basic introduction uh, to fluids and electrolytes, and again, we'll be talking about these in more detail as we go on in the program. Hang in there, guys. Take care.